So, good morning, everybody. My name is Marco, and uh, I'm here to talk to you uh, about curiosity. Yeah, so that was something I needed to think about. Not the talking, but more the, the theme. So, uh, I spent like an hour thinking about it, and then I prepared something, and I hope you will enjoy it. So, uh, what I like about a couple of things that I noticed. Uh, I noticed that we have a lot of friends all over the world. That's something I also really like that uh, we're not alone, so uh, hi everybody, uh, there's the camera, hi everybody in the other parts of the world, and Taksamuke for the curiosity theme to Malmö, that's really an interesting theme, and um, I'm gonna talk about a few things that relate, but at the same time are also very different, so you will see a lot of different concepts in my talk um, that uh, will explain itself, because I'm gonna talk about them. My uh, title uh, for the talk is Curious for Change, change and think about what that means to you and then or is it more to design for transformation and think about the different concepts of change and transformation and how they are different and how you envision them to be different think about it we'll come back to that later so I'm also curious and mostly about you guys what you think about inventions and who you think invented the, the next couple of products who invented this? Wright Brothers. Wright Brothers, yeah, okay. Anybody else? Or is that the answer? Yeah, all right. Da Vinci. Da Vinci, also interesting. Yeah, this one? Steve Jobs. Did he invent this? Okay, yeah, interesting. Penicillin? Fleming, I heard, yeah. Is that the answer? Other inventors, no? Telephone? Bell? Bell? Tell? Mr. Tell. Okay, William Tell. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Grain Bell? Is that the answer? Yeah? Yeah, okay, interesting, interesting. All right. So can you also name an, an invention that was named after its inventor? Tesla. Yeah? The, the Tesla car was invented by Tesla? Yeah? Mm hmm. Other ones? Yeah? That's difficult, eh? Pasteurization. Which one? Pasteurization. Pasteurization. I heard something else, but I'm afraid to, to uh, repeat it. <laughs> yeah? Pasteurization. Anything else? The Duguero type. Duguero type? Yeah. Okay, okay. One more, one more. Come on. Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard. And what's the invention? <laughs> HP, okay, okay, all right. Shall I just uh, give my answer to all of those? They're all incorrect. All of them. At least if you think about Stickler's Law. Because Stickler's Law dictates that no scientific discovery or invention is named after its original discoverer. Of course, Tesla is, but I mean, uh, yeah. so think about that. And you already mentioned that someone else took the credits for something. Which one was that again? The, the telephone? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Well, he was an inventor, but someone else also invented it. Indeed. So it's not just one person doing the, inven the inventions. There are thousands of people that you need to come up with one invention. But there's always one person that gets the credit. And this was already written before the whole IP stories, but it's an important thing and it shows why I never get the credits. <laughs> so, there's another thing going on. Something called multiple discovery. And this is something else. This, this, this dictates that you have inventions happening on different places in the, on the planet at the same time. So the TV was invented on different places simu simultaneously. Same with the telephone. Same with many, many other inventions. Agriculture. Agriculture, yeah? Yeah, good one. Interesting one also. Pyramids, Pyramids. yeah. Yeah, so indeed, multi, multiple discovery. And what does that um, uh, tell us then about the myths that we embrace usually? That the lone genius exists. That's what people usually think. And the fact that, for example, we say Steve Jobs invented the iPhone 
what does that tell us about how we see things, how we look at in innovation and inventions? And that great ideas are rare. Are they? Well, if they are coming about on so many different places in the earth, perhaps they are not. Okay, so what does that tell us? No invention was ever really done alone. No invention was uh, really referring to its real inventor. And no invention was ever really done in one place. And what does that teach us then? Perhaps that we can orchestrate inventions, that we can orchestrate innovation in such a way that we can engineer those insights and the processes behind it that lead to those inventions. And there's a company called Intellectual Ventures uh, coming from uh, two, uh, the two founders worked at Microsoft before and then they started this company that was more about orchestrating that type of aha moments, uh, synergy and the building on each other's work. So the magic that happens in a room when you uh, create inventions. And uh, what he did was put a lot of smart people in one room from different disciplines and just close the door and see what came out. <laughs> so he said, okay, and many things came out actually. And uh, they have now 800 employees and they file for 450 patents every year. And that's how they work. The only thing they do is invent and then patent things and then of course sell those things. There is some controversy because they also uh, have been, uh, um, uh, well, some people state that they buy uh, and purchase licenses so that they are not really inventing all of them. But uh, at least in the beginning, they were orchestrating that type of inventions. If you want to take this to your household, you might say that design thinking is like the, I don't know, the, the, the normal man's uh, 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 version of inventions. So it's the light version. We, we go into a room, we put a lot of people from different disciplines there, and we try to create stuff. We try to get ideas there. And all of the aha moments and also orchestrating that synergy between people, between ideas. The only difference is that uh, the way uh, Intellectual Ventures was uh, uh, trying to pursue it was just putting people in a room and then the magic happened. But this is usually problem-based, eh? so we want to fix something. We want to change something. And uh, in design thinking, uh, empathy and curiosity, they are in a central role, especially to make change, to innovate, and to solve problems. So a lot of people, they say that design can change the world. Do we believe in this? Yes? Who says yes? That's fewer than I thought. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So how can design change the world then? And what is change? What is changing the world? What does that mean? And why am I talking about this? Well, hi, my name is Marco. Um, I'm head of programs and impact of the Digital Society School, a school that actually really tries to orchestrate again also this kind of, of uh, fixing problems on a global scale putting people um, together, we call them learners, and they're all researchers, professionals, uh, real students, coming together to fix problems, urban challenges, or the, the greater global goals that we're facing in projects. Uh, I'm also a community liaison since uh, recently uh, for the World Design Organization. That means that I'm actually doing this kind of stuff to, to raise awareness among the community, among the design community. And I also co-founded Design Method Toolkit, Global Goals Jam, Design Across Cultures. And you will see all of those things coming back in the talk and coming back in how I say curiosity and change and transformation relate. So we are curious for change. So if you think about that design thinking element, we're all going to do a lot of post-its. We're all going to uh, do a lot of workshops, jams, hackathons. Uh, we're trying to orchestrate things. We're trying to make change. We're very curious for change at the moment. However, we were all, not always like that. As a species, we're actually not really uh, fond of, of, of change. And we're not really good at it. So, because um, when we were, of course, uh, evolving, change was actually a bad thing. So being curious for change, what was behind the hill, was actually very dangerous because it was unknown and then you could get killed. So curiosity actually meant more certain death. Doesn't mean it right now, eh? so there's nothing going to happen to you. Um, and now, actually, we won't 
we don't want anything else than just change. We want to change things all the time. That's why we're in those rooms with the post-its. We want to see change, we want to orchestrate change. And why are we doing that? It's because there's a lot going on, of course, so there are a lot of complex problems. Um, but, uh, and we have the tools and we have the mentality for it. We evolved actually in such a way that we're now adapting ourselves. That's why we're a different species than other types of species on this planet. Because we can adapt ourselves and it makes us actually humans to be curious and to aim for change. However, is being actively curious for that change, is that enough then? What does that mean? Does it change the world? I'm not so sure, because I think there's a big difference between change and transformation. And we're all saying change, but at the same time, change is something that is like something external happening. Yeah, so if you think of a, a butterfly coming out of the cocoon, it's not changing, it's transforming. So if you want to leave something behind, it's about transformation. If you want to just like uh, redecorate, that's change. So that's, uh, it's also weird that in, in our daily uh, um, vocabulary, we use the two terms like interchangeably a lot. So if you look at the, um, uh, for example, the home um, uh, makeover shows, they always talk about transformation, but actually they're just changing the decoration, right? And uh, when you look at the shows where they try to make uh, 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 your, uh, I don't know, wardrobe different you, to give you a new style, they always talk about transformation. They don't, try, they don't talk about changing your hairstyle or something like that. And why is that? It's because they want to leave something behind. So they want to really show that there's something old and there's something new. And that's transformation. And I think if we look at the global issues that we're facing, we want something new. We don't want to just change things, we want to transform things. Um, if you look at what happens then with us as persons, change is really about just an external um, um, action trying to influence our behavior. And then transformation is about trying to orchestrate you changing your actions based on different values and beliefs. So I think that we need to, for that, to be able to do that as designers, as creatives, to ask ourselves why all the time. And that's also what we do with those post-its a lot. Design thinking, the first thing, uh, the first um, um, uh, step in design thinking is empathy. It's asking a lot of questions. It's asking a lot of whys. And then it's about this. It's about this phase. Are we then designing a new vase, or are we designing for experiencing flowers in a different way? So we need to ask ourselves what is behind the vase in order to talk about transformation. If you de design a different vase, it's change, right? That's the difference. So I call that design for transformation. And at the same time, in order to do this, we need to also transform ourselves as a, as a field. So design actually needs a transformation in order to get the right mindset. So let's take a larger perspective. Why are we talking about this? Design actually plays a pivotal role in the way the world works and the way the world is designed, everything that we have here. And it can also play a role in changing things, in transforming things. So that's why we need to think about, OK, um, uh, we need different thinking. We need different mindset in order to change the, the problems that we have. And designers should become more activistic because of that. Otherwise, there's no movement behind it. And what we are not so good at, and I will talk about that later, is that we're not really good at sharing and building on each other's work. And I, I'm sure you disagree with this, yeah, just from gut feeling. But if I ask you how much you have shared or how much you have reused from others, I'm sure we, we can have a debate about it, right? It's more about inspiration, but it's not so much reusing things and really trying to uh, use other people's insights. So the problem is, that we waste our creativity eh, all the time because we're doing all those things in those rooms and in our own room, behind the computer or with other people, but we're not sharing it with people around the world. So we are very bad at sharing. <laughs> not so good, not so good. And this is also because, of course, our profession is very self-centered. So creativity is normally felt as, upon as something very personal and um, people feel vulnerable when you share things, so that's difficult already. 
And at the, at the same time, it's never done, it's never finished. Actually, I think my talk is not finished. I'm just sharing it now, but it's not finished. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on there. And I call that the real design waste. The fact that we don't reuse each other's um, insights, that we don't really, all those post-its, they go into the, in the, into the waste bin. They're not reused, they're not really looked upon. So what is happening? Is the end result then the most important or can we also use all the things that led up to it? So design waste is the phenomenon that uh, where vital insights from the design process, so not so much the end result, but the process are not documented, shared, found and reused and therefore go to waste. So we put everything on Behance, but all the other stuff is nowhere to be found. But it's still very interesting, I think, especially if we want to move forward. So um, we set out, not me alone, but we set out to be on a global mission to uh, fight design waste. How can we do that? Trying to get more of a culture of sharing in the design field. Eh? So how can we make people share more? We also think that there is a global vision and a global uh, impact is necessary for it. Because of course, if we only share within the Netherlands, we don't solve global issues. So the local um, focus is important, but the global impact is even more important. And then, of course, we need to become some kind of community that learns from each other, that builds upon each other's work. We need to find each other, not only in these types of ev events, but also when we're behind the computer working on our own stuff. So we need not only to be curious for sharing, but also really share. Yeah? So not only on the inspirational level. Uh, we started something that is not very radical, but at least uh, we wanted to uh, see how this worked. So we wanted to create this common language so that everybody at least was on the same page in types of working, in the types of methodology. And design thinking is quite good at it in terms of the process, but the methods that are used are not always the same. So, and the way they are used are not the same. So we wanted to create that. So we started the design method toolkit um, that we worked on uh, in the Media Lab when we were uh, still called the Media Lab Amsterdam. Um, uh, and had students working with them, not only in Amsterdam, but also in different places in the world, and trying to see the differences and trying to see how they uh, work differently with different methods. And they're built up in such a way that documentation is very important and standardization. So we try to relate it to the Scrum uh, process, way of working, so that everybody has their own task and documenting and sharing is one of those tasks. Uh, you can also find it online, all the methods. We have 52 methods there, or even more, I think. Um, designmethodtoolkit.com, and then you can have a look and try it out yourself. Then the second pillar that I think we need is a global network. Uh, we have the Creative Amsterdam, uh, the Creative uh, Mornings uh, Network, but it needs to be a network that also works together. So we started a network of um, um, cities, of uh, initiatives within cities that work together on different levels. And uh, we wanted to then have that multiple discovery where you have ideas in different places in the world and orchestrate that ourselves and try to see if things could come together. So we started to work with the United Nations on the global goals for the sustainable development because we said, okay, that at least is something that everybody wants to work towards to. So these are the 17 goals here. They are becoming now really popular at the moment. And of course, you can say they are huge goals. But at least there's some kind of consensus about that which goals are important and where we have to work towards as world population. And uh, we thought that would be good. So we had teams working on different projects, but relating it to the different goals. And we started calling that event the Global Goals Jam. It's actually the way it was um, structured is similar to all the other types of jams, the service jam, the golf jam, the, the game jam. Two days of intensive design work with one purpose. And that purpose for us is working on those goals from a local perspective. I'm gonna show you a brief clip uh, of last year where you can see what that looks like. And uh, of course, then I'm gonna do the commercial break to join us this year. Uh, the ingredients of that uh, jam, common language of methods, everybody used that design method toolkit, the same sprint structure, and then we have this community 
also before and after communicating with each other and working together. Here it goes. We live in a world of plenty. Plenty of people, plenty of passion, knowledge, skills, and definitely plenty of ideas. Today's environment asks for an unprecedented amount of creativity. We really have to think big. However, many incredible ideas are nothing without the people who pick them up and make them real. The people who understand that making change starts with creation. The people who understand that making something real often requires starting small. The global goals for sustainable development that we've set for 2030 are highly ambitious. We have to make a real difference in a short amount of time. We need to think big, start small, and act fast. Together we can be designers and creators of the future. So let's team up now and take action to make that difference. To be able to build upon each other's work, we need a common language of tools and methods. A common language to make it easier to collaborate on a global scale and share our work. This is the Global Goals Jam. Join us. Take action and design 2030 now. So that's going to be again this year in September. Anneke is our global coordinator for the jam. When is it again? The third week? 21st, 22nd. So write that down in your calendar. Um, so. That's, that's how we start a community, at least, of people that want to engage with this kind of thinking. And then, of course, you also need then a second step. How can you then make that more sustainable? How can people work together afterwards? And uh, we started another program, uh, more of a curriculum around the, the Sustainable Development Goals, to work together for a longer period of time. And that's uh, Design Across Cultures. So we have teams uh, working on different places in the world, at, at simultaneously on the same projects and sharing the insights, sharing the methods, sharing the results of those methods. And then, of course, solutions can be interlinked. Uh, doesn't always happen, but that's not, that's not the case, uh, that's not bad, if it's at least trying to get people um, to get together and being those activists and working together in similar ways. So, um, the multiple discovery part, that we can work on. Another initiative that we started is the Digital Society School. So Media Lab Amsterdam is kind of the predecessor, uh, um, of, um, uh, predecessor of, of the Digital Society School, which is a way bigger school now, where what I mentioned, the learners are not only professional students and researchers, but also the community, you, you guys. You can join in different modules. Um, you don't need to get any credits, but you can join us and then you become part of that learning community and you can become part of that activism, uh, part of the activistic uh, movement that we want to reach those goals. So I invite you to be curious for the Digital Science School. So it's kind of a call for a community. Eh? And so you have to have, um, uh, you can be from different disciplines, doesn't matter. We're working on digital solutions, but they're all coming from different perspectives and different um, um, yeah, different um, um, themes and trends that we work on. So, for example, data-driven transformation, Internet of Everything, um, um, these kind of more societal trends that we relate to technology and design. Become part of it. So, I want to end with a, a nice quote. The base of creativity is humility and not knowing. Yeah, so nothing interesting comes from knowing, it comes from not knowing. I think that's important, that we keep reminding ourselves that we know nothing. That we have to ask those questions, the why questions, and that it's not only about that we want to change stuff, but about that we want to transform things. Thank you. Let's stay curious. Um, I wanted to ask about the standardized methods that you mentioned to spread the word. Uh, how do you see this um, spreading design thinking and the an understanding for standardized methods, how to approach them, in contrast to very complex problems and maybe taking on these methods, having to change them because maybe they don't fit to the context. So design thinking can be simplified, but then also it's 
it works in very complex processes. How do you teach that to people as well? Yes, it's a very good and fair question because, of course, standardization is not always the right uh, answer to things, especially if things are complex and dynamic. So uh, the way we envision this, this design method toolkit um, is as a common language, and a language is always moving, is always uh, dynamic. Eh? So new words pop up, and we, we incorporate them in our language. So the idea is also with the partners that we have um, to really mention that the methods can be adapted and also changed, and new methods can come in. The only thing is that we want um, to have something where everything comes together and also in the way everything is structured. So when new things come in, they have to be structured in a similar way so that the way of working stays, remains the same. And uh, that's what we teach. And, um, and of course, uh, what we're very interested in is also, um, uh, we call it design across cultures is of course the cultural dimensions. Eh? So there's a lot of, there are a lot of differences between how people use methods. Uh, I can be anecdotal about it, so there's not real research evidence, but uh, we've noticed that, for example, in India, community is more important. So here in the West, we do a lot of individual ethnographic uh, investigation on getting insight for the design process. And there, those individual insights didn't mean that much. So it was more about community. Uh, group observations, and we didn't have any method for that. So that's interesting. And then we, we asked them, please also incorporate methods that you have in this, in this design method toolkit. And we're thinking now, okay, perhaps we need some modules to make it at least a bit more um, structured so that you can, yeah, so for example, in a region, you can have different methods that you can use or for different purposes. Does it answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite solution that came out of last year's Global Goals Jam? In terms of concept? Yeah? Oh man, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> there were so many uh, concepts. Perhaps, uh, Anneke, yeah, you already feel it. Can I ask you, perhaps, uh, to name two or three, at least? Oh, yeah, the and, one uh, with the they worked in the creative space where a lot of disabled people worked, and they were trying to find a way to get people, well, to invent something for them, uh, and it ended up on a way to get them to the toilet using a sort of a hook instead of using two people. So the result was that you could, like, these are creative people, so they want to do what they want and whenever they want, and they probably organize <coughs> everyone to the freedom. But then for really simple things, they needed two people to go to the toilet. And uh, yeah, they sort of tested also with the person in the wheelchair who participated in the gym. So I think that was a nice, yeah. Yeah, and, and this is a nice example. Thanks, Anneke. Um, uh, because it's not only about the third world or something. Yeah? So that's also what the, 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 um, uh, the idea that people have around those sustainable development goals. It's about the goals in every place on the earth. So yeah, this, this was a problem in, in Fukuoka in Japan. And then there, it had impact. And then from there, we can use it perhaps in different contexts. So yeah, so it's more about how we tackle those things than about that we have a favorite or something. Because we have had many discussions in the, in the past days also about, OK, what is important about this jam? In two days, can we transform the world? Not really, right? Can we reach those goals? Not really. So what is important? I think the activistic part. So more to get people uh, in, into a certain mindset. How can you tackle those goals using design? And what does it mean? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So I wanted to ask a hard question, but how do you get people to follow up and implement those solutions and do something about it after just uh, giving these ideas? Thanks so much, Gal. I knew. <laughs> no, so that's also a very fair question. So, just like we had those discussion about the the output of the of the jam. Eh? So, what's the value of those concepts? Uh, how well thought through are they? How well researched are they? Uh, that's of influence on what you can do afterwards with them. So. Uh, what we're trying to do is not really solve it ourselves, but trying to see if we can link 
our initiative to different initiatives that that can follow up. And at the moment, we have um, uh, we're doing some pilots on uh, creating a curriculum, so more on a university level, trying to get the concepts and have students work them out in the curriculum uh, settings, studio settings. And at the same time, also uh, there's something that is called Global Goals Labs. It's more of an incubator around the global goals. Uh, we're also at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, and Anik is also involved in it, uh, working on a, a sustainable development goal box. And that is also meant to help you incubate ideas afterwards. Um, so it's, it's more about getting the people, planet, profit thing right, so that you, that, um, uh, that it's going to be a sustainable concept at the end. So you need to, of course, also create a business case around it. And you need time for that. So we're trying to link to other initiatives for that. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.